know about being passed over for opportunities, I want to talk with you about the gender dynamic that was the number one gender dynamic in almost every country all around the world when uh, measured by men, the male managers, but it was almost never on the radar screen in the women's focus groups. And that was, is men's culture of mentorship about business or organizational acumen. Mm. <laughs> Many of you have informal mentors. Yeah. And when you work with your mentors, what kinds of help are you getting from them? What do they help you with? Setting and achieving professional goals. So setting and achieving professional goals, what else? Navigating the politics of it. Navigating <laughs> politics, good, what else? Perspective. Perspectives. Distressing. Pardon? Distressing. Distressing. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> if that's all important, but not all inclusive of what's necessary. When we talk about being passed over for opportunities, and I've worked mostly in for-profit settings, but I have worked quite a bit in non-for-profit settings. Well, let me ask you another question. How many of you have a boss who's a woman? Almost everybody. How many of you, when you look at the top of your parent organization, see all women? Okay, a couple of you, that's awesome. Okay, how many of you see 50% women? Yeah, a couple more. So something happens between you and the top, right? Well, here's some insight into what happens between you and the top, and it speaks to what kind of mentoring you might not be getting if you want to advance to senior positions. When we asked uh, the male managers what kind of barriers are there to women's advancement, they said things like this. Women often don't show enough business acumen. Now that's slightly different than the politic at navigating politics. What that means, and it's the same in nonprofit organizations as profit organizations, what that means is women don't understand the, what the people at the top care about in terms of metrics. They don't understand how, business, how, the, how a hospital system or a hospital or even a school or a physician's office. They don't understand the business of running the business. High potentials show greater than average business acumen and most women don't. So I know in some of your organizations, there are conversations about succession, who's going to take the place of people when they leave. I see some odds out there. So they look for high potential candidates. Well, at the top of your organization, what they're looking for is high potentials who have all the great attributes that, that you have. Good with people, care about patients, clinically strong, uh, good, good uh, professionalism, but also they're looking for people who understand the business. So why else do women get passed over? Because when it comes to business acumen, most women are average, and so their names don't even come up in succession discussions. Women believe that their individual achievements should get them ahead. It's not enough. How many of you think if you work hard, you'll get ahead? <laughs> yeah, me. You know, I'll work really, really hard, and someone will come and pat me on the head and say, great job, Susan. Let's give you a new opportunity. It's not enough. And then finally, oh, this is an interesting one. When we sit down and we talk about the business and what's going on in the business and in our industry or our profession and, and in the, 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 uh, the, the marketplace or the societal milieu around us, she really doesn't seem to be in the know. She doesn't have anything to say. She doesn't seem that interested. So this is really serious. And that it has to do with that culture of mentorship, that men are much more comfortable mentoring other men on the, of the business. But you can get it if you ask for it. 
So I have so so we've talked about things organizations can do. They can have a policy for women's advancement. They can uh, require diverse candidates' leads. But I want to take a minute and talk about something that you can do. So most all of you are awesome at your professions, and you understand and are very focused on patient outcomes, right? Or student outcomes. Some of you are in school systems. Is there anyone here who would say, no, I don't care about the outcomes for my patients and clients? <laughs> of course not. You're very focused on patient outcomes. It's why you're as excellent as you are. If you have as a goal to advance in your organization, no matter what kind of an organization it is, <clears throat> there are things to add to your, your identity. This isn't becoming someone you aren't. It's expanding who you are. So is anyone here the same woman that you were 10 years ago? No, okay. So here's some ideas about how to expand for the next 10 years. If you aren't already the head of your function, it's important to understand what those people care about. What are the functional outcomes? So what are nursing outcomes? What are social work outcomes? Not patient outcomes. But what's your function looking at you to contribute to in terms of overall metrics? What are, um, uh, uh, for CMS, pay for performance, how do you contribute to the hospital's performance if you're in a hospital system? Uh, what kinds of physical therapy outcomes is the head of your department looking for? So understanding functional outcomes and how you contribute to them. And I worked in, in, uh, at Rhode Island Hospital for lifespan for about five years. And there was always this tension between, you know, oh no, if I, if, I, if, if I take a different perspective than focusing on my patient, then I'm not focusing on my patient. No, you can add to the focus on the patient an understanding of how what you do rolls up to quality metrics, for example. Thank you for your nodding in the back. Um, but then, so how many, any of you uh, functional department heads here? Okay. So you're, oh, let me do something fun with you. I've got a few more minutes. Okay, everybody stand up with empty hands. <laughs> I want you to fall asleep out of that here. Oh man, where can I stand so you can all see me? Uh, oh, shit, my audition. Okay, so here's what you're going to do. You're going to take your dominant hand and you're going to put it up above your head. And you're going to look up to make sure your finger's pointing straight up. Then you're going to make a clockwise circle on the ceiling with your finger. And without letting your finger get lazy, so keeping it pointed straight up, bring it down below your eye level. What direction is the circle going? Counterclockwise. Woo! Magic! <laughs> Isn't that the coolest thing? Okay, you can sit down. <laughs> yeah, I haven't figured it out. I haven't figured it out. What is what is that I have to do? No, it's just magic. So what does that have to do with what we're talking about? What you see depends <laughs> on where you stand. And so above your functional management is the overall management of the organization. And so adding to your understanding of functional outcomes that you drive is beginning to understand how you help the whole organization move forward. So pay attention to business outcomes. So when you look at your boss, what you see is very different than what his or her boss sees when they look at the boss. So people who are at the very top of your organization are paying attention to metrics that your function contributes to and that you contribute to. And if you can understand how you move your organization forward, then you're beginning to develop that business acumen that is part of being seen as a candidate for higher level positions. So patient outcomes, functional outcomes, business outcomes. 
they're all important. Eleanor Roosevelt said it really well, but if we want, I'm going to summarize, if we want to play in organizations, we have to learn to speak the language of organizations. And that means understanding all three levels of outcomes, the ones you contribute to with your patients, how those roll up to your functional performance, and how those roll up to help move the whole organization forward. <coughs> now, the gender dynamic of uh, the mentorship and business acumen was number one on the minds of men. Number two on the minds of the male managers was the motherhood penalty and the fatherhood reward. This was number one worldwide for women. And you, you share this. 40% of you said that it was an issue that you had encountered, and 60% of you said that this was a stressor for your patients and clients. So the motherhood penalty and the fatherhood reward, what does that mean? It means that in organizations, women who are mothers are seen as less capable, competent, and committed than men who are fathers. Men who are fathers are seen as more capable, competent, and committed than their single male counterparts. So, isn't that bizarre that we as mothers are seen as less committed, competent, and capable? Well, here's a, here's a little explanation of why that might be. When it comes to thinking about work world and personal world, women and men are miles apart on this. Most men, research, uh, Shanti Feldhan, her awesome book, The Male Factor, talks about this. Most men see the work world as something totally separate from their personal world. And each has its own different rules. Okay, some of you are relating to this. Uh, this is not how most women experience personal world and work world. We tend to see the work world as a piece of our personal world. And the rules in one roll over to the other. So whereas for men, it might be OK to do certain things at work because they understand that that's a game they're playing, but they would never do those things at home. I mean, I'm sure that Bernie Madoff thought he was an awesome father in his personal world, but boy, did he screw people in his work world, right? So that's an extreme example. We think that, that the rules are the same in both worlds. So when, when men set up the machinery of organizations, they set it up thinking that, you know, there's the work world and there's the personal world, and then in the 1970s, we came full war to try to change everything with this whole different mindset about work world and personal world. What happens when we become mothers? Some of this we do, and some of this is done to us. That our work world be is seen by our male counterparts as shrinking, which is why, and I've experienced this all around the world, even if a woman is seriously committed to maintaining her career, seriously committed to advancing in her career, has resources in place to help her do both. Men in, the, in discussions about opportunities for new assignments will say things like, she just had another kid she wouldn't want to move. She, she has a family. She wouldn't want to take that international assignment. She wouldn't want that job. There's too much travel associated with it. So that these, none of you are working in international companies, but you might have children, daughters who are. So one thing we can do here, so we have to hold managers accountable for these stereotypes. Most companies aren't doing any work in this space. I know of none in Rhode Island that are. So we have to be really smart about helping ourselves and our daughters know how to counter these stereotypes or gender dynamics when they encounter them. So every year we're